how he responds, how the team responds. Let's welcome in Elliot Friedman, who always responds with great intel. So we were just talking about the Canucks. Bumpy start, to say the least. What changes for Travis Green if they continue to look this way? You know, I do think the Canucks have started to look around uh, on some of the outsides of their roster. Uh, Jake Vertanen, he's a player who was a first-round draft pick a few years ago. I think we're we're nearing the end of the run with him in Vancouver. I think everybody kind of recognizes that there's room, that it's time for a change here of scenery. Uh, I think also Adam Goddad, who's had a difficult time getting back in the lineup, I think they're, they're taking a look at what the market is for him out there, too. I think there would be interest. You know, the toughest thing right now, Tony, is, is is if you take a look at what Winnipeg just went through, you know, Roslovic didn't come to camp this year, but they traded line A and they, they had to go two weeks without Dubois. In Canada right now, it's a full 14-day quarantine. So if you make a deal with a club across the border, you're not getting your help. You're doubly shorthanded. So it's I think it's a big challenge for teams like the Canucks, and Calgary's got Sam Bennett out there right now. So that's a part of it. Now, I do think one of the teams that um, has looked in at Vertanen in particular is Boston. We'll see where this goes. I think they're looking for help on D. I think they're, you know, I was listening to what Michael and uh, and David were just saying. Like, I am in complete agreement with what they said. Like, they are letting Toronto do anything they want against Vancouver right now. And at the end of the day, the players have to say, we're not letting this happen to us anymore. Run over somebody. Just do something. And I think Vancouver needs that as much as they need help uh, around the fringes of their roster. We all have bosses. I wanted the second question to be about the Capitals, <clears throat> D.C., and your hair looking like second President John Adams. <laughs> I was told I could not do that. Instead, Capitals, <laughs> I'm glad you got it. <laughs> appreciate that. Caps Flyers, the NHL debuted rapid testing. What's the mm -hmm. latest on the rapid testing and the plan going forward? Well, first of all, Tony, let's just say that at 50, I'm glad I still have hair that can be compared to somebody. I mean, <laughs> there's there's a more head than there used to be, and there's a bald spot uh, on the top, but I still have a lot of this. Understood. Um, you know, I, I, I think this, um, you know, the NFL – they they were really fortunate run. They had their challenges, Tennessee Titans, Pittsburgh, you know, teams like that, but they never had to cancel games. And their information told them, and they announced it last week with the Center for Disease Control, that, and their line was, it didn't cross the line of scrimmage, so to speak. I think we're learning in the NHL with the rinks and the humidity and the ice, we're not going to be as fortunate. And so one of the things the players have been talking about is, can we have more testing? And, you know, the, the league was using the PCR test, which is the best test. It's the most accurate test. The problem is it takes time to get back. And as you heard Jeff Blaschel say it last week, it was leaving gaps. And they're recognizing that. So what they were trying to do towards the end of last week is get what's called rapid testing docking stations. And those are the things that you plug the rapid test into and it figures out if it's a positive or a negative. And the question was just getting their hands on all of them. Now, I think we have seen rapid testing at times during this year when Carolina was coming back to action. They were using them before practices to make sure guys weren't coming in still testing positive. You mentioned Philly and Washington did it the other day. I think you're going to see this on game days become a factor. Um, you know, I think everybody hoped they could avoid it, but they can't be avoided. We're, we're learning that the transmission is much more dangerous in, in, in hockey than it is in football. I will say one thing. In the last couple of days, Tony, had a lot of people who, who stressed to me that, that like, you know, the doctors are making the calls here. There, there's like nobody's overruling the doctors. And I think at the end of the day, especially with the new strain, there's a lot of worry with the new strain and how aggressive it is that maybe there's challenges here that the NHL had that, you know, a sport like the NFL didn't have, unfortunately. As far as I'm concerned, you're like Tom Brady at your job. The ability to talk hockey is one thing, but the in-depth medical stuff, great work by you. Thanks for helping us understand. Thanks for joining us tonight. All right, guys. Have a good night. Take care. And, Mike, uh, no hairy eyeball after, uh, after this segment. You did a great job. <laughs> well, hey, you were talking about having hair, and clearly I don't. So we'll, we'll see you later, Elliot. Good, good shot again, buddy. Appreciate it. <laughs>